Welcome, my loves, to the last episode of Poisonous Affairs. I can't believe it. We've made it to the end of February, um, and we made it to the end of the series, and I do hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed coming up with this, this series and bringing it to you. Before we get into the meat of this episode, I just wanted to let you know that I'll be taking the month of March off, but I, I'll still be posting content. I've, um, it's confession time. I'm confessing to you. Um, but I've fallen a bit behind creating content for these episodes. And as you know, it's a one woman show and I try my best to stay on top of things, but sometimes, sometimes I get swamped and ultimately fall behind. So sorry. <laughs> but as I mentioned, um, even though there won't be any new podcast episodes until April, I'll be posting content on Instagram, TikTok, and YouTube, so make sure to follow and subscribe. Without further ado, let's talk about the strange antidote for poison. And that was, my friends... Unicorn horns. Let's get into it. Welcome, my loves, to Poisonous Affairs. I'll be discussing the sordid details of some of the most talked about scandals that rocked the 17th century French and English courts. It's all about lust, power, greed, and murder. <laughs> So this article, um, I came across this article on history.com and I heard of um, unicorn horns being an antidote for poison from the book, The Royal Art of Poison. You should definitely check it out. It's a great read. Um, I read it on Scribd. Um, but, and I also came across unicorn horns being used during the plague. Um, it talked about it as a kind of remedy um, for the plague, which obviously it wasn't. <laughs> but um, so here we go. Elizabeth I, for one, was known to drink from a unicorn horn cup, believing that if poison touched it, it would explode. Being a king or queen has always been a treacherous job, between homicidal enemies, duplicitous courtiers, and backstabbing family members, royals had every reason to constantly fear for their lives. And there was one form of assassination that particularly terrified them, silent, invisible poison. For centuries before the Age of Enlightenment, paranoid royals sought protection in superstition, alchemy, and quackery. They paid enormous sums, sometimes a proverbial king's ransom, for magical objects they believed would neutralize, expose, or repel poison. The most coveted of those? The mythical unicorn horn, also known as an alicorn. Before chemistry was a thing, people believed that many objects and foodstuffs had magical virtues or properties, says Eleanor Herman, author of The Royal Art of Poison whose research documents the intentional poisoning of royals by their enemies and the protections they employed. It was only logical that unicorns, being very rare creatures, must have more virtue than any other. Rulers believed such items would protect them because that is what the most learned men of the time told them, notes Herman. These days, world leaders have their secret service agents, she says. Back then, they had their food tasters. Even the normally rational Queen Elizabeth I of England was a believer. In addition to buying a magnificent spiral unicorn horn for the lofty price of 10,000 pounds, she was also known, Herman says, to drink from a unicorn horn cup, believing that if poison touched it, it would explode. And she enjoyed an even more coveted specimen, described by historian Jerry Dennis in A Walk in the Animal Kingdom. When British explorer Martin Frobisher returned from his expedition to the Arctic in 1577, he brought with him a six-foot-long tusk that he had found on a dead sea unicorn. He tested the tusk's medical potency by placing spiders inside. When the spiders died, he declared the horn effective in neutralizing poison and presented it as a gift to Queen Elizabeth I. Now, the queen was so impressed with Frobisher's gift that she ordered it preserved with the British crown jewels. 
Of course, unicorn horns didn't come from mythical beasts, since, being mythical, they never likely existed. Most came from the tusk of Norwals, an arctic whale possessing a magnificent spiral tusk that can grow as long as nine feet. These remarkable appendages actually serve as a sensory organ, allowing the creature to detect subtle changes of temperature, pressure, and other atmospheric elements. The misnomer may have started with Viking traders who, around 1000 AD, began finding the tusks washed up on the beach in places like Greenland and selling them to Europeans. The trade strengthened during the Middle Ages when the unicorn became a symbol of Christ and therefore an almost holy animal. By the Renaissance, unicorn horns had developed a reputation as a poison cure-all and their cost inflated to ten times their weight in gold, or more. European rulers became obsessed with owning the magical unicorn horns, which became popular as state gifts. In 1533, Pope Clement VII presented King Francis I of France with a magnificent horn, mounted in solid gold. Ivan the Terrible had a staff made from one. Philip II of Spain apparently had twelve... The royal Habsburg family placed one of their tusks in a scepter covered in gemstones. And in the late 1600s, Christian V of Denmark sat on a throne of unicorn horns, which went on to be used in coronation ceremonies for centuries. But y'all still had questionable hygiene. Mm, 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 mm. Elizabeth's successor, King James I, was a bit more suspicious, according to Nigel Suckling, author of Unicorns. After purchasing a particularly costly horn, James tried it out by giving poison to a servant, followed by an antidote made of powdered unicorn horn. When the servant died, James believed he had been hoodwinked. Oh my, I've been bamboozled! <laughs> But guess what, folks? The most dangerous poisons were hiding in plain sight. Horns weren't the only antidotes royals employed against the dreaded poison. Some used stones etched with scorpions. Others placed gems such as emeralds and amethysts in their goblets. Still, others sought protection from powders crushed from bezor stones, which were hairballs and other undigestible solid masses pulled from animal stomachs, or... Toadstones, mythological gems embedded in a toad's forehead that were actually fossilized teeth of extinct fish. Shaking my head. Shaking my head in disbelief. To stave off poisoning attempts, some royals took a daily antidote of theriac to build immunity. Theriac ingredients included common foodstuffs like parsley, carrots, black pepper, cloves, wine, and honey, says Herman. Others ingested sulfur and garlic, now known to neutralize arsenic in the bloodstream. And, she added, some theriacs included real poison, such as arsenic in minute amounts to get the body used to it slowly, so that a single large dose might not prove fatal. Speaking of theriac, um, the common foodstuffs like parsley, carrots, black pepper, cloves, wine, and honey, um, they also believed during the plague that this would ward off the plague that you wouldn't get you know the plague if you actually took these theriac ingredients so um yeah if you haven't checked out those october special episodes about the plague go check them out and yes i'm shamelessly shamelessly i can't even speak anymore um advertising those episodes What's ironic in all of this is that royals, along with the general population, poison themselves daily in countless ways. Elizabeth I probably hastened her death by her constant use of lead-based white face paint. In her last year, she showed many signs of lead poisoning. Cosmetics and medications contained large amounts of mercury, lead, arsenic, animal and human feces, and urine. And dead body parts, says Herman. Mmm, mmm, mmm. And that's not counting all the banal, insidious ways people poison themselves. I imagine many royals were poisoned with infections, Herman says, pointing to the lack of regular bathing or sanitary plumbing facilities. 
Henry, Prince of Wales, died at the age of 18 in 1612 from typhoid, which he got either swimming in the river or eating oysters. Indeed, many people likely died of foodborne illnesses due to lack of refrigeration and thermometers and hard-to-control hearth cooking. Food poisoning, which must have been rather frequent, has almost all the same symptoms as arsenic poisoning, says Herman. Now science finally sidelined the horns. The reverent belief in the curative and preventative properties of unicorn horns and gemstones began to dissipate as the Enlightenment brought advances in scientific experimentation. By the late 17th century, magic, alchemy, and astrology were slowly replaced by chemistry and science. As unicorn horns and other poison remedies underwent repeated testing, old superstitions began to fall away. Interestingly, a few of those superstitious poison antidotes did turn out to have scientific support. One, says Herman, was clay from the Greek islands of Lemnos and Samos, called terra sigillata. The substance contains silicate particles which attract the metals of metal-based poisons such as arsenic. The clay then carries them out of the body, preventing them from fully absorbing into the bloodstream. Also effective, those fossilized shark's teeth called toadstones. The calcium carbonate in the fossils, she says, can neutralize poison. Today, unicorn horns can still be seen in royal collections across Europe, but now simply as an impressive decorative curiosity. We have come to the end, my friends. Thank you so much for tuning in, and I really do hope you enjoyed these February episodes. Remember that life is oftentimes stranger and more fucked up than fiction. Stay safe, my dumplings, and you'll hear from me again in April. <laughs>